When you're eating a high-protein diet in America, you're aging so rapidly that your digestive capacity starts to deteriorate. Fat on the body increases insulin resistance, increases estrogen, activates angiogenesis. That's one of the words you have to know, angiogenesis, which means the growth of blood vessels to feed fat growth and to feed cancer growth. And you're learning right now in this presentation that the primary anti-angiogenic foods are G-bombs. G-B-O-M-B-S, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, particularly green vegetables and mushrooms and onions. But mushrooms are perhaps the strongest anti-angiogenic food. Mushrooms don't allow blood cells, to new blood vessels to grow. They prevent the growth of new blood vessels. They're anti-angiogenic. And those mushrooms, of course, because of that, don't, doesn't allow fat to grow on your body and accelerates the shrinking of fat off your body. You're not eating mushrooms merely because they're low in calories. You're eating mushrooms because they help have powerful anti-angiogenic effects and help suck the fat off your body and prevent cancer cells from gleaning a blood, su blood supply, stopping cancer cells in their track from progressing further. The mushrooms say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you get fat or get cancer. No way, Jose, they say, they're, they're bilingual. So the major causes of breast cancer are the combination of diet through insulin, IGF-1, high processed foods, high protein, estrogen, but then the other part of the project is going to doctors and getting drugs. Because you start out bringing your child to a pediatrician, and the first thing they do with the first ear infection is put them on an antibiotic, immediately increasing the, per the child's risk of cancer. So right from the bat, they're going to start the kid on drugs, they're going to cause cancer, and going to make a cycle of continuous ear infections occur, because now with that initial, instead of allowing that child to get well from their first infection naturally, and recover from this mixture of a viral with some antibiotic overgrowth, allow the immune system with, with, the, with the, getting the immigrants from mother's breast milk and eating a healthy diet, Instead of allowing this child to recover on its own, they have to help it along with a little antibiotic. And when they help it along with an antibiotic, obviously, now you kill the good bacteria in the gut and you select out for more pathogenic bacteria and you make it more likely for more serious infections to occur. And their first ear infection now turns into a series of infections needing antibiotics throughout their childhood, needing more medical visits and medical dependency because the child was treated when they shouldn't have been treated for anything. And then of course, most drugs are carcinogenic. The first thing you learn in medical school in the first week is that drugs are toxic. And the reason why you're getting a medical degree is that you can stop people from using them needlessly. They're supposed to be reserved for only when they're absolutely necessary. And that's what you're actually taught, but then you go out into the real world and you see that's not the way people are really doing things. We're supposed to be, you know, the gatekeepers and stopping people from using drugs. What turns into the fact is that they, we have an opiate epidemic where everybody's getting narcotics from doctors. You know, it's like, right, or they're getting antibiotics. I remember in my practice, uh, people used to be, uh, the person used to come in, let's say to me, with a cold or something, and I'd say, well, it's a viral infection, you don't need anything, it'll just go away on its own. And then I'd get a call from the wife saying, my husband's a postman, I'll lose his job, give him the antibiotic. Or not, you know, or start screaming at me, you know, you know, to give them a drug. It's like these people are just this religious expectation that doctors have powers and drugs have powers that they don't really have. You know, everybody thinks doctors in medical care can do stuff it can't do. And then we talked about the ridiculous nature of folic acid supplementations, because what current medical authorities and health authorities do is they try to solve every problem with a pill, like the problem of why women have birth defects because they don't eat green vegetables and they try to solve it with a pill like taking folic acid. Or you have high blood pressure, they instead of telling you to eat a good diet, if you never had blood pressure medications, right? Doctors would be picking you up and shaking you by the neck and smacking your head against the wall and say, what are you doing committing suicide with food like that? Come back next week with a low blood pressure. You better get off that junk food and get off the salt and get off the grease and beef up. come back a few pounds lighter and let's see if your blood pressure drops. What if your diabetes or glucose is running? You gotta get the glucose down. You better go start taking a walk and start eating some healthy food and stuff. Not, But now, no, we can just keep people on the path to food addiction and just give them drugs and now get them addicted to drugs while they're addicted to food. So as you do all these things, living in these, the modern world, 
where we have this cancer-causing envi food environment and cancer-causing medical environment, you build up defects that accumulate all through life that start, you start the process of developing cancer in childhood. And then you have cells that are precancerous moving on to cancer cells at some point in your life because it takes a lot of years to accumulate enough of these methylation defects but vegetables prevent the accumulation of methylation defects, and green vegetables in particular have the ability to reverse methylation defects. So the cumulative damage to your DNA that started happening in your childhood, you have time to slowly chip at it and remove those defects one by one as the cells are activated with nutritional excellence. But you only have this chance to chip away these defects and heal the DNA if you adopt a diet of nutritional excellence. You can't just make your diet moderately good by still, you know, let's say going to restaurants on the weekend or dabbling halfway in both worlds and eating healthy vegetables, but then going back and having your, your junk food and your cookies. And your, it's, not, it's not gonna work. In order to chip away at the methylation defects, and undo that damage that occurred in, the fir in many, many decades of your life, it really takes, we're finding, this synergistic effect of a lot of beneficial anti-cancer compounds and phytochemicals coming from a wide variety of plant foods, herbs, spices, and even the judicious use of supplements to make sure the human body's immune system is functioning at a full level of capacity. And when you do that, we see miraculous things happen to the body. The first thing we got to do is we have to remove the excess animal protein from the American diet. You can't possibly prevent or reverse cancer because the animal protein promotes cancer through raising IGF-1. Here's that pool data. I think I showed you this slide that showed that higher levels of IGF-1 in the blood are linked to higher rates of breast cancer and prostate cancer. This is 17 studies pooled. And here's that study of animal protein in death. The first study, because I'm showing you there's multiple studies here, that showed that diets low in sugar and white flour were studied. So they couldn't say, oh, the higher cancer wasn't caused by the high protein. It's caused by the high protein and the sugar. If you took the sugar and the white flour and the white potato and the french fries and this pasta out of the diet, the person wouldn't have cancer on a high protein diet. No, that's been already, that argument's been well studied and disproved by now that even if you take all the sugar and white flour and white pasta and honey and maple syrup and white potato and, and rice out of the diet and you still give them animal products, you still get a lot of cancer. Here they took over 6,000 people, they followed them. They were between the ages of 50 and 65 and they followed them for 18 years. So between the ages of 50 and 65, that means the average age was around 60, let's say, or 58. So if they say the average age is 60, and we follow them for 18 years, they will follow from the year of 60 to the year of 78, till they were 78 years old, right? They followed them for those 18 years. And what they found, they, they divide, the people were divided into three groups. Low protein, low animal protein, moderate animal protein, high animal protein. And the high animal protein group had a four-fold increase, that's a 400% increased risk of cancer deaths compared to the lower protein group when they followed them. And there was a 75% increase in overall death over that 18 year period in the group that had the high protein diet. And as, of course, a 75 increase risk of developing diabetes in the higher protein group compared to the lower protein group as well. But look at the grouping here for a second. Because the high protein group were only consuming about 18% of calories from protein. Because this study was not, was a worldwide study. And in this country, we eat about 30% of calories from animal products, which is about 22% of calories from pro animal protein. So the, this group had, the high protein group had less animal products than they eat in America. And then the moderate protein group with 9% and the low protein group with 4%, which represents about 5% of calories from animal products. So worldwide in this study, the lower protein group was much lower much lower than what Americans eat, and there was no real, nothing even close, the fact that the moderate protein group was still at much higher risk with only about 10% of calories from animal products. Keeping in mind this very strong relationship between animal protein and risk of death through cancer, 
was not shown as clearly as people were over the age of 80. This was only because these people were in the 50 to 65 followed for 18 years until the age of 80. Over the age of 80, protein bioavailability goes down and animal protein becomes less toxic and the lack of protein in the diet becomes more potentially a risk factor because the immune system could be reduced in function if body proteins get too low. Now, what I'm saying right now is that when you eat a nutritarian diet, you, your digestive tract stays more youthful. You have adequate assimilation, and you continue to benefit and get adequate protein as you age. When you're eating a high-protein diet in America, you're aging so rapidly that your digestive capacity starts to deteriorate. And as you get older, you get more dependent on a high-protein diet because there's so much inflammation and lack of digestive capacity that if you start to, that your body really needs extra protein in order for your immune system to function. Now, that ability to monitor, we're talking here about this ability to monitor the protein needs of the body is a critical factor in enabling people to live a longer life. Here's a different study. Here's the animal protein in death two. Different study. Here's a 25-year follow-up with more than 6,000 deaths also showed that the dietary carbohydrates were taken out and processed carbohydrates were, were low, so there was no chance of saying that, the, that these people, that the outcome was caused by a consumption of high glycemic carbohydrates. And this meta-analysis of studies published in 2018 with a 25-year follow-up showed that those people with the lowest carbohydrate intake, that means they weren't getting, they were, that if their lowest carbohydrate intakes, mean most of their diet came from protein and fat, from animal products. It means they were eating less plant foods because plant food exposure, after you remove the processed high glycemic processed foods, is mostly vegetables and fruit. Did you follow that? If I take out the sugar, the white flour, the white rice, and your diet is then richer in carbohydrate, it's richer in vegetables. So the lower carbohydrate intake is representing lower vegetable intake. So those with the carbohydrate intake below 30% had the most early life death. Less vegetables, less carbohydrate, more early life death. This diet that I'm recommending people eat, a nutritarian diet, is not a low carbohydrate diet, not a high carbohydrate diet. It's not a low fat diet or a high fat diet. It's not a low protein diet or a high fat diet. It's protein adequate, fat adequate, and carbohydrate adequate. It's not super low in any one macronutrient, but it's relatively low in all three compared to what Americans are eating. It's lower in calories and most of the protein is plant protein and most of the fat is plant fat and most of the carbohydrate is coming from whole plant foods that are not highly glycemic. And of course, the same diet showed that more plant foods made for a longer lifespan and corroborated the studies that higher protein plant foods made people live longer. So these studies are starting to show that more protein when coming from plants make people live longer. More protein, you live longer, but only when it's from plants. More protein from animal products makes you live shorter, leading to the culmination of most nutritional researchers studying these issues around the world, that the ideal diet for longevity is a diet that has more high-protein plant foods in it, especially as we age, paying attention to protein adequacy without trying to achieve protein adequacy with too much animal products. We try to achieve protein adequacy by maximizing the protein bioavailability from healthy plant foods. So this study, of course, the title of this study published in 2020 was a recent study, Dietary Intake of Total Animal and Plant Protein and Risk of All Cause of Death, Cardiovascular Death, Cancer Death, Mortality, Systemic Review and Dose Response Meta-Analysis of Prospective Cohort Studies, showing a comprehensive overview of all the scientific literature on these, in this issue, showing that higher intake of plant protein is the most important factor extending life and reducing death from all causes. Completely different from what people thought completely different from what the conventional community thinks, and that the conventional community thinks you gotta have animal products and vegetables, and if without having, and the vegan diet's not as healthy, you gotta eat more animal, you gotta eat more protein, and what the plant food and vegan community is telling you, that doesn't, and nothing really matters except if you eat totally plants, you don't have to worry about any protein, just eat plants and you're gonna be okay, and your diet can be as low in protein as you want, live on just fruit, live on just rice, live on just potato, live, you know, whatever you're eating is okay, just as long as you don't eat animal products. And the lower in fat, the better. And they're all, and they're both wrong. Because these studies are pretty definitive and they're corroborated by multiple studies showing the same thing today, that we have to modulate our protein for ideal lifespan. A nutritarian diet is unique 
because it pays attention to these factors that have been developed over the last two decades, that the culmination of scientific research, of studies from around the world with different researchers, corroborate each other and make this methodology definitive. And that's that we have to eat a diet that has a lot of nutritional variety. And nutritional variety increases the protein bioavailability and the viability and diversity of bacteria in the gut simultaneously. That this idea that amino acid complementation and mixing together beans and greens and this and that doesn't matter because no matter what you eat gives you enough protein. That's what we were trying to teach people for the last 20 years, but it's not totally true because when you have a variety of foods in your diet with different amino acid complement that are complementing each other, you do have increased viability for protein digestibility and maintenance of IGF-1 in a level that doesn't get too low as you get older and your protein level of um, protein assimilation and, and immune system support and stem cell support starts to diminish because as you get older, the immune system falters, your digestive capacity falters, you get weaker and you eventually die. You don't live forever. If you don't live forever, it means the systems in the body weakens as you age. And the systems that weaken as you age or immune system dysfunction occurs as people get older. And the, if you're not going to take an adequate zinc, an adequate DHA, an adequate protein, an adequate, uh, have all these adequate nutrients as you get older, your immune system will pe peter out faster. So we have the ability to modulate that by knowing what these factors are that maintain immune system viability in, the la in later life. And that's why the Nutritarian diet contains beans, at least half a cup a day of mixed beans. Then they're as part, of, and we're eating at least an ounce and a half of nuts a day. But as we get older, probably that's even a little inadequate because we shouldn't be overweight. We should be able to take a little more nuts and seeds to the upper to the ideal level of nuts and seeds between two and three ounces of nuts and seeds a day, which is which is more than a half an ounce with each meal. I'm saying a half an ounce with each meal is the minimum for people who are overweight. But as you're getting to where you're, you should be achieving your ideal weight, and you should be able to add, eat more than an ounce and a half of nuts a day without becoming overweight. Because an, a half, an ounce of nuts is only 175 calories. You eat two ounces of nuts a day, it's only 350 calories. You're going to eat, you should be able to eat to eat like 1,500, between 1,400 and 1,700 calories a day. We feed people in our retreat a diet between 1,200 and 1,600 calories a day, but I don't eat that diet they eat. I take the same food I'm serving the retreat people who are overweight, and I'm adding more nuts to it, or I'm adding a little extra beans on my salad, or I'm adding a little extra piece of Ezekiel bread, or I'm, rather, I'm having a half an avocado, or I'm having more calories to bring my calories up higher because I'm not need, I don't want to lose weight. And, they, and just like so every person doesn't follow the same amount of calories, but these people are somewhat more caloric restricted than me because they're looking to reduce their body weight. So the, when I'm saying eat an ounce and a half of nuts or seeds a day, that's the minimum, but not for people who are trying to lose weight. But as they get slim and older, they should increase that a little bit to get more protein, particularly you're paying attention to the higher protein nuts and seeds like we talked about, like almonds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, pine nuts, hemp seeds, and things like that that have adequate protein with the beans, with the greens, because that combination of beans, greens, and, and higher protein nuts and seeds give you a more than adequate protein exposure. Generous serving of both raw and cooked greens, including things like broccoli, florets, and artichoke hearts, and string beans, and Brussels sprouts are all high-protein foods. We're eating those foods liberally, in abundance, right? We're eating a couple of cups of green vegetables, right, that are, have maybe 10 grams of protein per cup. The Nutritarian diet is a high-protein plant-based diet compared to other plant-based or um, diets. And then we're having a large salad every day, too, to make sure we have exposure to enough lettuce and raw vegetables and as much variety of raw vegetables as possible. So just to review, the nuts and seeds highest in omega-3 are walnuts, hemp seeds, chia seeds, and flax seeds, those should be at least one-third of your nut to, to one-half of your nut intake. And the nuts and seeds that are highest in protein are hemp, which 40 grams of protein per cup, pine nuts, 40 grams of protein per cup. That means 10 grams per quarter cup. It's a lot of protein, a quarter cup of those foods, right? A quarter cup of hemp seeds, a quarter cup of pine nuts, a quarter cup of sunflower seeds. That's a lot of protein, 10 grams per quarter cup. And legumes, beans, are of course, soybeans, 28 grams of protein a cup, edamame, 18 a, a cup, Lentils, 18 a cup, white beans, 17, kidney, black beans, split peas, 16. Those are, that's pretty a lot of protein because we, you know, we want to get about up. We want to, it's very easy to get, get plenty of protein. But the, the diet is designed 
with a lot of nutrients and a lot of protein. You see how you, this is just a different way of looking at almost the same information. Broccoli, five grams a cup. That's a lot of protein just for broccoli with so little calories. Broccoli and artichoke hearts, almost no calories, but so high in protein, right? That's so little calories to get this, almost to get 10 grams of, two cups of broccoli. How many calories is that? Like 75 calories? You're getting 10 grams of protein at 75 calories? It's a huge, a huge amount of protein, right? Get a hamburger, you're taking in 300 calories to get 10 grams of protein. Now, the WHEEL study, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study, showed that vegetable intake showed the best correlation for reduction of cancers at all types and reduction of breast cancer. Over 3,000 women with breast cancer were also followed as part of the WHEEL study, and that showed that women who ate more green vegetables a day, three servings to a half a serving a day, cut the risk of breast cancer recurrence in half, and the vegetables, of course, the cruciferous vegetables, again, showed the most protection against breast cancer recurrence. But the interesting thing was the study was that it showed that fruit and vegetables combined had more power against cancer than just vegetables alone. That people who ate the vegetables didn't eat any fruit, didn't do as well as people who ate the vegetables and ate the fruit too. Getting back to that basic principle you're learning on nutritional diversity, we're not cutting out any food group here. We're having fruits, vegetables, beans, mushrooms, carbohydrates, nuts, as opposed to these other kind of programs that are telling you, don't eat the nuts, don't eat the fruit, don't eat it, right? We're trying to have, don't eat the fat, don't eat the, we're trying to have a wide diversity of food. And I'm saying to you also that we have this unique opportunity in human history to, get, to actually achieve a diet with a wider diversity than could have been achieved in prior generations. And we could take advantage of this ability to eat a wide diversity of food and have such a good exposure to nutrients. We can check blood tests. We can take an additional supplement if needed to make sure our vitamin B12 is in the right level, our zinc, our iodine. We could make sure that even when the plant foods are low in certain nutrients, we could supplement them conservatively and intelligently to make sure we optimize those levels to um, optimize human health.